Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is a Screencast-O-Matic presentation and recording for the part of the lesson that has us looking at media and government and also media regulation. Before we get started, please let me encourage you to open up to today's lesson to scroll down the correct section and get ready to fill in the content for the fill in the blank sections accordingly. Please also remember that you can replay any part of this presentation for detailed clarity or repetition later on. Let's go ahead and get started. So what is media regulation and what role does our government play in watching, monitoring, and adjusting to safety and security and transparency with information and communication? Consider that question for the rest of the presentation. As you're aware, the mass media is basically the epicenter for all the means of communication in our democracy with information to the general public and also additionally through newspapers, magazines, radio, television, the internet, and more. Journalism essentially is the coverage or the act of covering a news story that is meant to make it to and through the media outlets and to and through the public. Only 28% of Americans believe journalists contribute a lot to society. Today, there seems to be a rather negative rhetoric or stance against journalists. Many Americans blame the stories of violence and celebrities and focus on the wrong issues at hand instead of the real issues that matter to the American voter. Additionally, reporters cultivate sources within government that provide information and insight on the issues, but sometimes their own discretion is used, thus creating the perfect storm for bias. Government uses the media to gain a sense of public opinion too regarding certain policies. However, the use um, that the media does in this way can sometimes alter the message of the narrative to people in power. Journalists often see their job as informing the public, but lately it seems to be that journalists are often taking advocative stance on certain issues where their opinions, morals, and values come through instead of the actual news story. However, it should be understood that with the three branches in government that we have, the media still does play an important role. For example, take the executive branch. News releases, briefings, press conferences, leaks, and more are all key parts to how the media keeps us informed about what's happening in the office of the presidency and the ex executive branch. Broadcast media, for example, like with radio and television is really important at covering this. Um, and if you remember, Franklin Delano Roosevelt mastered the art of communication while first using fireside chats over radio as a means of communication. But when it comes to elections, mass media is also important too. The mass media has turned elections into sporting events, and unfortunately that has in many ways altered the type of news coverage that's being conveyed to you. Similar themes emerge too when we talk about the legislative branch in the media. The media does cover Congress, although the way that it does this is often rather negatively, as partisan gridlock stops any progressive reforms of actually being implemented uh, in terms of, of course, any type of legislation being signed into law. Now, C-SPAN is a channel that essentially covers a lot of our political world in an immensely um, nonstop way. Although when it comes to television campaigns or legislative campaigns, uh, the media also infiltrates information to the public so we can make informed decisions. Now, when it comes to voting for an issue, uh, additionally, the media can shape the narrative of information being shaped to us uh, through their own reporting. Now, when it comes to covering the Supreme Court, generally speaking, the media tends to err on the side of neutrality with this, especially when it comes to uh, the appointment of a new Supreme Court justice or decisions from the Supreme Court. However, recently, media scholars do note that there tends to be this biased notion from journalists and media companies to you, the viewer, um, as the Supreme Court and the courts in general have turned into a rather partisan political issue for them. Just to be clear, typically, uh, the media only covers issues of national importance to the viewers, and you might seldom actually never hear any information about the courts in America. Let's take a brief look at media protections in America. It's true that the First Amendment does prevent the media from being censored before something is published. We call this prior restraint, and the Crash Course Media Regulation did talk about this. However, with freedom of the press, please realize that it's not necessarily absolute. For example, libel laws exist, which pertain to false written or published statements that damage a person's reputation, and so too do defamation laws, which of course pertain to false expression that injures a person's reputation. These two types of things can be incredibly dangerous, so of course monitoring them and stopping them is incredibly important. When it comes to legislation, perhaps no piece of legislation has been more fundamental in transforming media and regulation than the Freedom of Information Act, or the FOIA which does require federal agencies to release files to the public 
unless the material falls into certain exceptions for national security or other confidential information. Now, the Supreme Court has typically ruled that the media does not have a special access over the public in this regard, which of course I'm sure makes a lot of journalists upset in this way. However, if there's one thing that Americans want in their government and elected officials, it is transparency. Now, when it comes to other media protections, reporters do not need to reveal their sources, and so shield laws enable them to basically report the news upon which they do, and the Privacy Protection Act of 1980 prevents all levels of government from searching for and seizing source documentation as well, so safeguards are in fact put in place to protect people and entities. Also, when it comes to regulating the media, perhaps no institution is more fundamentally important than the FCC or the Federal Communications Commission. Their main job is to regulate interstate and international communications and media, and of course, they often require TV and radio to operate within the public interest, and of course, they can be fined for not doing so. Now, they mainly deal with content of broadcast and ownership of the media, but the FCC has, of course, placed fines upon people who run afoul of the guidelines put in place. When it comes to content regulation, regulation itself, uh, the FCC stipulates that they must provide opposing viewpoints. Um, and of course, other entities have pushed for um, clean programming, so you can't air obscene programming, and additionally, um, I guess you could say off-color, borderline inappropriate behavior. The FCC, however, cannot censor broadcasts, but it can issue fines, like I said before, for not um, essentially abiding by those guidelines and contours, and also for not renewing the station's license. Licensures are really important in the news world and media as well. Now, when it comes to ownership regulation, these are a different series of laws and problems as well. Of course, ownership regulation has limited the number of radio stations a company can control, which in many ways might be good. However, this could also limit cross-ownership too, where a company could not own a television station, a radio station, and a newspaper all together at once. In many ways, this might make them too big and too powerful, thus possibly making them a monopoly. This changed in the 1990s, however, with the internet and increasing telephone lines, as, of course, new types of technology would yield new types of media. Perhaps nothing was more transformative than the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which did relax many of the FCC laws for the time. However, they also stipulated that companies could not control more than 35% of the national market, thus yet again prohibiting the rise and expansion of monopoly-like media. On issues of national security, rules are also set down in place as well. Government controls some information by classifying it as secret, for our protection. However, this became a huge issue with the Vietnam War, especially as rising tides and sentiments against the war came to fruition. Even in 2003, journalists started traveling with troops into battle, uh, when we went to, of course, Iraq and Afghanistan. And they would not only report live about what they experienced, but of course would give us on-the-ground coverage. As you can see, the future of media regulation really rests on a few moving pieces, of course, media and changing technology, but also the institutions that oversee them, pertaining to, of course, government, legislation, politicians and officials, and more. But don't forget about the most important piece in all this, you. As long as you remember that, and remember, of course, to watch the media as much as you might watch the other three branches of government, you too can be an informed citizen who advocates for the best and most free and legal uh, access to information in our changing media landscape. Thank you very much for tuning in, and good luck with completing the rest of the lesson.